Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a really exciting guest talking about one of the crucial subjects for higher education, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But before we start that, let me just introduce the program, explain what it is, what we hope to accomplish, and then we'll start this week's talk. Uh, we've been thinking about how higher education prepares students for the world of work ever since we launched. And we've had guests talking about a whole range of topics, everything from campus business partnerships to what governments can do to ways of ascertaining and publishing skills. Now we'd like to bring on the director of a great project in DC. Jeff Strahl is here to talk about how higher education can best prepare students for the workforce, which is a topic of a great deal of concern for, well, I would think just about everybody. Now, let me bring him up on stage. And I should say that Jeff is coming to us from just a few miles away from where I am right now. Apparently. That's right. That's right. So thank you for having me. Oh, Jeff, it's a real pleasure. It's a real pleasure. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, I, I have to ask, um, we ask people to introduce themselves by talking about what they're doing next. And I'm curious, you know, you with the CD, CEW, what lies ahead for you for the next year? What are the big projects and what are the big topics? Well, I think starting from the big topics, I think it's going to be tackling the value of college education in this environment of which everybody's saying college isn't worth it. So I think it's a very mm. worthwhile topic mm. to be taken on. And that kind of nests in with the skills based hiring movement, which I think is creating some confusion about the value of college education. So I think those are really topical elements. Yeah. Um, and then we're continuing our work on affirmative action and now what follows the SCOTUS decision. So we'll continue doing work on race and class equity, both in education outcomes as well as labor market outcomes. Few projects on uh, return on investment, trying to just look at costs with the evolution of the scorecard data. And then uh, um, we'll be doing a piece on uh, what's called What's It Worth? It's a long time series that we've repeated looking at uh, how ma BA major fields of study, how they play out in the labor market, go, or go to graduate school, things like that. So those are just a couple items. And then uh, the last one, which is my ongoing pet, uh, which I think will come in here, which is the value of general versus specific education, which I think becomes very important mm -hmm. as we see this swing back to uh, um, skills based hiring, CTE, things like that. Well, that's a lot to discuss. A lot. Yeah. To work <laughs> and, Keep and, you busy. And forgive me, I, I, I totally lapsed and didn't say it. you were the director of the Center for Education and, the work, and Workforce. And you've been director for what, uh, six months now? Uh, probably close to three or four. Our, okay. our founding director, Tony Carnavali, uh, retired at the end of the summer. I've worked with him for about 30 years. Previously, I was the uh, director wow. of research here. Okay. And we've had him as a guest before. You know, oh, you have? Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and so if you're new to the CEW, you can, first of all, look at our previous session, friends, but also you can look in the bottom left of the screen. You should see a little tan colored box that says Center for Education and Workforce. That'll take your the website and you can learn a lot more. Uh, just so you know, Jeff, in, in the chat box, one of our good friends has just said, what a stunning contrast in head and facial hair. And I think I think that's that's right, Vanessa. Thanks a lot. That's you know, between us is like one average person. I think. Yeah, I donated my hair to Brian. Uh, that's that's exactly what happened. <laughs> that's the true story. That's the true story. Uh, and Jeff, when you mentioned the college scorecard, that's the uh, Department of Education, federal government uh, scorecard that came yes. out in the Obama administration. Very yep. good. Very good. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, I'm, I'm going to ask Jeff a couple of questions to get the ball rolling, but I want you to be prepared with your questions and your comments. So uh, as you take a look at their website, but also as you listen to Jeff's commentary, uh, please think about what you'd like to ask him. Um, as you can tell, um, we're both very friendly and we're, we're glad to hear your questions and comments in, in any way. Uh, I guess my the first question I'd like to ask Jeff is, for all the controversy over higher education right now, you mentioned the value proposition, you mentioned the arguments about not going to college. What, what is higher education doing well in terms of workforce preparation? What are we doing right that we should hold on to? Uh, well, I would actually focus in on the community colleges on this regard because they're yeah. usually much more sensitive to uh, local labor market demand. Their programs are terminal. They split between transfer programs, which tend not to be used as much as we would like to see, and then more occupationally focused. But if we look at the data, uh, even across the four-year sector, something like 70% of all programs are for occupational preparation. So 
they do the program delivery well, sometimes they miss the fact that the students are looking for a job. And in, and so four-year sector is not so good about always embracing the workforce aspect of their education role. But their, their provision definitely gets people prepared for work. Hmm. And, and what, is, what is it about? What's the secret that uh, the community college sector has, has learned? Um, well, I think they're not monolithic. I would say that the good examples are where the community colleges are able to work with employers to understand the direction that the labor market is going in, to understand um, uh, how the curriculum meets uh, employer skills without necessarily becoming an assembly line for capitalism is an old old line of mine. Uh, and then secondly, one thing they're doing quite well is we've seen in the labor market the growth of industry and occupational certifications, which are a test-based instrument. They're not credit bearing, but the community colleges have embraced them to a fairly well and have begun doing mm. what are called embedded certifications where they help teach the curriculum so that the students can actually prepare for the exams. And and there's, you know, 30 some odd million people with certifications. So they're really you know, valuable uh, and people of all levels get them. But since they're not Title IV accredited, they're not credit bearing, the community mm. college is where people get their training for them. And so they're a nice morphing now between our credit bearing and, and non-credit bearing uh, delivery. So I like to see that part. I think they're doing that well. They're keeping ahead of the, they're, uh, keeping ahead of the curve. Mm, that's interesting. That's mm. very interesting. Um, I guess you could probably anticipate my next question, which is, uh, what are, what's, what's the euphemism that we do when we're grading a student paper? What needs improvement? What, uh, what across what, the system or with community colleges or both across the system? And what are, what are, what are the real problems that we need to address? Well, I would say without a doubt, the biggest problem out there is graduation rates. We have a system that is lucky to get 65% graduation rates. There is no production system in human history with that level of failure that has continued to the level that our system has. And the people who drop out uh, carry all the debt and none of the benefits of a college yeah. education are very little benefits. And there's lots of bias by race and class in those outcomes. So we see folks like my son going to four year institution. He's going to be four years and done or he better be four years and done. He just started <laughs> uh, where low income first time co going students average six years. So they get a heck of a lot more debt. They drop out at a much higher rate. So we yeah. look at that transfer problem the system you know we do all this regulation in k-12 and all of a sudden post-secondary is virtually unregulated so some regulations right mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we don't do transfer well <laughs> we don't do graduation rate, rates well and we don't uh, distribute the resources in a way that i think will get to the highest social utility so if we look at these huge disparities on funding the most selective institutions on average, top 200, they're about $30,000, $40,000 per student per year in education mm -hmm. expenditures, where the community colleges are between roughly six or 7,000. So mm. that's a big driver, I believe, between one part of uh, low graduation rates that we see in the community college sector. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to press on that, but but friends, I want to make sure that you're ready to... Uh... Uh, to ask some questions of, of your own. Uh, I mean, it, it, the, the low graduation rate is, is just, I, I think, an open scandal. Uh, I, mean, I agree. Mm. I mean, there's something to be said about, about adults and also teenagers you know, trying out higher education and stepping back if it's not for them, you know, or if they're only doing it for one particular narrow purpose and they don't, they're not interested in certification. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's one function, but, but too many people have tried and bounced out and, as you say, walk away with the debt and not the sheepskin, which is mm -hmm. the worst of all possible worlds in, in many ways, especially when they've lost the opportunity cost of, of taking oh, classes yeah, and not right. working. Um, what do you think of the uh, uh, a possibility of trying to better document, uh, express, and share skills and academic credits, uh, you know, everything from micro-credentials to blockchain-backed certificates? Uh, you know, the, the history of this is we've got these big lumps of, of certification, you know, the BA, the AA, the BS. Um, is, is, would this kind of thing help if we can, if we can build up more micro-credentials and more shareable credentials, or is that not going to do any, anything significant? That's a, a very good question because we haven't had enough uh, 
uh, experience with it to really understand what direction it is going to go in. So first on blockchain, I've had people come to me, blockchain, 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 and I have yet to figure out really what blockchain adds to the equation. So I'm going to kind okay. of just remove that. I think it's mostly a security and an informational uh, add on rather than something to give us any value to the actual credentials. Now, okay. on the micro credentials themselves, on the upside, as we think about the quickly evolving nature of the labor market, especially as we've globalized and as we have quickly changing technology, micro credentials are a way to get bite sized bits of updated education and training so that the worker and the human individual can may be, become updated much more quickly. Um, if they sidestep some of the lags in accreditation, there's an additional value. They're able to be very flexible, very speedy in response to changes. I think that's a real plus. Now, the downside is as we get more and more and more, you have a Tower of Babel problem. You don't know where the value is. You don't know if you're doing apples to apples translation. You don't know who, who delivered it. So there's a, a signaling problem. And I use signaling mm -hmm. in the way that Michael Spence did. He, you know, Often people say it's just a signal. Mm -hmm. Signals have value and sometimes and often they signal the value. Right. So there's not a necessarily an empty uh, a signal. Um, but from the employer perspective, if you see something you've never heard of micro credential of one thousand and twenty seven eight oh nine, you have to do an awful lot of work to figure out what it is. So if we want micro credentials to work, we have to figure out good ways to validate their skill in a low cost fashion. So if that keeps, if that gets pressed onto the employer, I don't think they're gonna work. Uh, if there's a way to bundle to them and uh, to validate them, perhaps. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag, but we do see if I use certifications mm -hmm. as probably the most predominant type of semi micro credential, they're between three and six months of uh, training, there's 30 million of them. 35 million of them, people, people with them, right? And oh, often oh, okay. they have two or th often they have two or three of them. Uh -huh. uh, and so uh -huh. they're used, they're useful and uh, people get an earnings premium from them. Uh, so as yes, that is an example, there's about 7,000 of them. So my Tower of Babel problem, I, we can cast that off to the side, right? People do, the labor market accepts them. They're seen as being valuable. So there could be hope and their value, I think, lies in that they're test-based by when they're good. They're test-based. Do they sort of have backup by the industry or the occupation? So there is a, a good solid signal that they can be robust. The bad side, of course, you get snake oil salesmen, right? Yeah. You yeah. can have Jeff's or, uh, micro credential in fashion, right? I mean, it's like, what's it going to do for you? And how, uh, it, so it's, it's not so clear. Or Trump University uh, credentials. The, uh, um, do you think there's a role for the federal government in this? Or is this just a big collective action problem involving lots of associations, universities, uh, and uh, accreditors? Uh, on the micro credentials. Yeah, yeah. That's a good that's a good question. The federal dollars are attached to funding them. Yes, I think the federal government needs to have a role in regulation and accountability because the private sector has not demonstrated itself uh, responsible enough to do that uh, on the main. Um, so I think we need to guarantee, you know, uh, guarantee a proof of purchase kind of kind of concept yeah. and the federal government is the one to do that because of the nature of the education labor market the education market is just not a free market it doesn't have the characteristics that we would say so the collective action solution oh. across you know we got 20 million people in post secondary i'm not sure how many would get micro credentials uh, it's you know it's big there's a lot of movement for um, a false bill of goods i would say so the federal government could play a role but we have to also be careful about having the federal role be so onerous that it it, it limits the flexibility that we might get from these items right yeah, yeah. and so you know this might be one of those cases where 10 years from now we have a unique public private solution Mm. Uh, that we can't mm. really imagine right now. So maybe the federal government would set the criterion for early entry and yeah. uh, updating, right? So you come back and check. Mm. Mm. Um, so 
could be. Yeah. Now, the federal government hasn't done too well. If you look at things like uh, discrimination and safety inspections, they mm -hmm. try to use the threat of inspection and fine to mm -hmm. discipline the rest of the market. They, they review less than a percent of uh, uh, employment cases on discrimination and the fines are so small, people just accept mm. the fine as doing business. So it hasn't affected the market. So mm. that would be the, the fear, right? That the federal government would just be, I'm going to say, uh, uh, wouldn't be effective uh, from resource perspective, et cetera. Um, Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Friends, I, I, I want to turn this over to you for your questions. Um, as you can see, uh, Jeff is someone who is extremely knowledgeable about this and, and, and happy to talk. Um, if, you, uh, if you're new to the forum, again, take a look at the very bottom of the screen on that white strip, the couple of buttons. If you want to join us on stage, click that raised hand button. Or you just want to type in a comment or a question, just hit the Q&A box. Uh, we have one observation in the, in the chat from Assistant Dean uh, Lauren Sinclair, who says micro-internships are now being promoted by our Center for Professional Development. Now, those are new to me. Have, have you looked at this at all, Jeff? Not at all. No, no. Yeah. Um, it sounds like a great idea. I've had a bunch of talks about the value of internships. And with the failure of the youth labor market in the United States, people haven't had that ability to figure out about work as well as work in their field. And so the more we can bring the workplace and the classroom together, the better off we can get the education from the classroom real it becomes practice move from theory to in practice right that's great yeah. i mean it sounds like a good idea i'd love to hear more detail I'll, I'll be looking that up after this uh talk well let me see if i can bring her up on stage and in fact let me just adjust the uh the, the video a little bit and see uh she just clicked the raised hand button um hello dean sinclair <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? I can yep. hear you perfectly, but I cannot see you. I'm sorry, I'm new to this system and I'm trying okay. to. <laughs> well, it's good to hear you. Go, but It's really good to hear um, you. Well, well, welcome the, aboard. As I, I can't quite figure it out. Um, oh, please turn on your click. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll just proceed with my question. I, I'm, at a, I'm at a liberal arts college. I'm at Loyola Marymount University in Los oh, sure. Angeles. Yeah. And, um, you know, we are grappling with uh, how to express the full value of a liberal arts degree. And I know that it's not all, it's not equivalent to, you know, the career outcomes, but that is a major motivating factor for students. Uh, and, I find that alumni are very eloquent in expressing the the outcomes and the benefits of their education in their career experiences post graduation. But I also find that incoming students really struggle to understand what a liberal arts degree is going to be able to do for them in terms of their career aspirations. And currently, we're dealing with quite a lot of students who want to transfer to a business school or a professional school. Uh, we're trying a variety of approaches through our um, discipline, through our de various departments and disciplines. Concurrently, I'm, I'm quite alarmed that language study is plummeting. Mm -hmm. And I see all of this kind of as related to, I guess, um, the way Americans are viewing the purpose of higher education. And I wonder, you know, from your perspectives, if there's any um, materials that we should be looking at when we are trying to move forward with programming and infrastructure to support um, career readiness and professional development across the liberal arts disciplines uh, so that we can, you know, be transparent with students about the benefits. Well, I, uh, this is great. I think it's an extremely important question. I am a uh died in the wool supporter of uh liberal arts education uh and i think that liberal arts has been on the defensive for too long and they need to get very aggressive because they have an important value add and so just looking at it from the career outcomes perspective there's a very good 
something on the census website that demonstrates the career outcomes of about 170 majors and maps them to occupations. And one thing I show in these data is that American history majors, for instance, are the highest, uh, be best labor market outcomes of the humanities cool. uh, in the liberal arts. And think about it, there's not many historian jobs. So what is it about that particular humanities that does well? Well, it's the ability to use one's general education. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, uh, to use their general education. So this movement against college education and general education is, is that what's the value of specific education? It's looking at specific. So if I train you to be uh, an engineer, well, then you can become an engineer. If I train you to be a historian, you don't become a historian, but you do well. And we've lost this argument partially because the liberal arts and higher education institutions have done a bunch of hand waving about how wonderful it is that college makes you a better person and da 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 da. 90% of the students in schools want a job. And I think that we need to tackle very aggressively that humanities and liberal arts education have very good outcomes. They don't beat STEM, but that's okay. I take the top uh, petroleum engineers at 130,000 entry, frame, but the, the, the little bars do fine making 70. I mean, they're doing fine well above the, the thing. So that the, these data, I think, can help. And counseling on that level would be very helpful. There's a wonderful paper on what's called uh, occupational funneling. It's a qualitative study, but I'm a great believer in that. Uh, and they show that without counseling, that students come into these institutions with a, uh, and this was a private selective, so I've got 56 private selectives. Um, and they, they come in without counseling. They don't have any, their, their interests are wide. They start listening to their friends and they funnel into business consulting and, and leave the door. And we lose all this human talent that is really necessary for a wide, uh, the, the depth of our, uh, our economy and our civilization. And it missed. So bringing that information in at the beginning, it says you're not making a mistake to be a historian or a sociology or straight liberal, uh, you know, liberal studies. It's it's going to be OK. And this gets to the general education component, which is how we are. The U.S. economy is is successful. What it is because we're flexible and the flexibility of our economy is directly linked to our investment in general education. Specific education holds us back from what's called the production possibilities frontier because it's it's not as flexible. We can't absorb new technology as quickly. So that's just a pure economic argument. The other side of, it, of course, is the non-pecuniary benefits. But I'm hesitant with those because while I believe many of these benefits are highly correlated with education, I don't want to turn it around and say someone without a college education isn't a good citizen. I know many people without a college education who are a better civil citizen than I am. So I think we need to adjust that argument just a little bit. Um, so anyways, that's a long answer to a short question. I, I like this po point about the flexible economy because one of the one of the benefits of a liberal arts education is a, a flexible mindset. Um, so I think that there are some parallels there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, thank you. It's real. Thank you for the question, uh, Dean. Yeah. Sinclair. It's great to see you. Oh, and, hey, well, before you go, um, take care of those fires. Uh, be safe. Um, that's really, really frightening. Thank you so much. Of course, uh, friends. That's an example of a video question. So if your uh, if your camera is on and your microphone is on, you can see you can join us just as easily as can be. Uh, now we have an example of a Q and A question, uh, and this is one coming from uh, not too far from us right now, actually, Jeff. This is from the University of Richmond, and we have a good question. Our first question about AI. We have another one coming. Um, thank you, uh, Jeff and Brian. For Jeff, regarding the unregulated barrage of certification programs we have across the country, how do you see the burst of AI certificates? Uh, well, first, I want to be, this is semantics, but important, certifications. Mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. completely different from a certificate. A certificate is a, ba is a badge of educational mastery commonly delivered by a post-secondary information where a certification is most often a test-based uh, acknowledgement of uh, mm -hmm. mastery of a particular set of skills. And so they differ mm -hmm. a, a lot. And certifications, I think, can, can have a lot more various, I guess, certifications too. Uh, the I was just in California, I was at a gig at Stanford looking at the role of uh, public 
uh, private universities and the public good. And I was just amazed at how many uh, billboards after billboard after billboard were um, announcing what, you know, we use AI, you know, think mm -hmm. on, onwards and onwards. And so, uh, you know, this, I, I don't know what to make of it, to be quite frank, because I don't think there's a lot of there there yet. Uh, mm -hmm. And so everybody is excited about the hype about AI, but I don't think people know what it is. So I'm questioning what those certificates are. Uh, and, and until we see something solid, I, I, I just don't know what to make of it. I'd be really, really skeptical. And I was just actually reading a thing in The Economist that talks about the cycle of these fads, that you get this big burst of enthusiasm, and then you see a huge decline in that they start becoming profit loss and then they slowly actually begin to show their benefit and so we're in this phase right now with ai where it's half fear half promise but not a lot of substance i think there are about five percent of u.s manufacturer uh, u.s companies are actually making use of ai and that same percentage have plans to do so i'm not sure. so i think it's going to be slow integration in real terms and it's probably gonna be a couple of years before we can put our hand on it right so mm. Mm. um well this is um um well there's a lot to be said about this um and uh i, I guess one question i would i would build onto that is do you uh what do you see of the role of ai in helping either produce or assess uh certifications it's a good question i had not actually thought about that. I talked to uh, someone, uh, 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 another journalist about uh, AI. And um, one of the things that I don't know that it does well is synthesize multiple functions uh, into an activity. So the degree to mm -hmm. which writing a certificate or certifications, if it's very single focused, I think that a AI ought to be able to, as far as I understand, be able to reach out and grab singular information about that thing and create it into a knowledge tool. That seems to be a reasonable thing. I don't understand how well they are at filtering out the crap, right? And so if it reaches out and pulls information and treats all that information at the same level of validity, uh, when I'm looking at the internet and everything I hear about, you know, questionable sources, not just fake news, but questionable sources or just yes. slight misinterpretations, I would fear their inaccuracy and I would want to have more bona fide uh, uh, experts at least validating them. We're doing quality control, right? Just, you know, take a look at 5% of them and see how well they do. Oh, that's a good thought. Thank you. Thank you. That was a um, just can't put that on the spot. Um, but let me get out of the way. Uh, we, we have other questions coming in. Um, we have one from uh, our, our good friend, uh, Brent Anders, the uh, uh, AI literacy guru out mm. of the American University of Armenia. And he couldn't make it here, but he wanted to share a question. So let me just, it's, it's a big one. Uh, okay. so let me just uh, read this. Um, what are your thoughts on the need for all educational institutions to incorporate AI literacy into their curriculums in order to pre properly prepare students for the workforce. So that, that's the, the, the first. He, he follows it up with a couple of, uh, a couple of twists. Uh, he wants to know more about um, what your thoughts are about automation in the workforce, uh, okay. both AI and robotics. OK. Well, let me uh, start at it. And you might have to remind me about the other parts. Um, I believe we have to stop being afraid of AI. It's presented as an terms probably outdated, but it's a new boogeyman. It's a new thing to be feared about. It's a new thing that's going to destroy work as we know it in the world, et cetera. Being illiterate about what AI is, how it, it works, means that we're more likely to be able to use it as a tool rather than be afraid of it. And so the literacy aspect, I think, is just critically important. What is it? What isn't it? What can it do? What can it do? Act, you know, just understand in real terms what it is means we'll be able to utilize it as a tool now on the question about automation robotics um you know this goes back to my thing about being the boogeyman you know which is that i, I went through offshoring 30 million american jobs are vulnerable to offshoring 
Mm -hmm. The real estimate, real outcomes are between one and three million. Uh, you look at automation. The big estimates were 40 million jobs are vulnerable to automation. Uh, a new report came out that says it's around eight. And the difference between those two reports, and this will get into the AI, is that the big estimates are looking at an occupation as a single task, the single main task that somebody did. The lower estimate is, is looking to the fact that people do a wide variety of skill sets uh, in the job. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. one that's vulnerable mm -hmm. to automation uh, isn't necessarily what you do all day. And they know that a good strategy is to have mm -hmm. a breadth of skills. So I think the same when we think about strategies and this idea of literacy. First, we have to understand what AI is. Second, we have to understand how we can use it as a tool or master it, be somebody who designs AI, right? Then you're top of the food chain if it does uh, take over the world. Um, but then how do we integrate AI with this portfolio of skills, right? And so seeing our value, and this gets back to this single task versus multiple tasks. Human beings are really good at understanding a multi-layered contextual basis and coming to conclusions almost instinctually, and especially once you gain a lot of experience in your field. It's not clear that AI is going to do that. So I see it being relegated. We can relegate it to that tool category, at least for now. I mean, the future, you know, we can always have uh, great imaginations about where AI could go to, right? We, anything's possible. But I think from where we stand now, hmm. uh, back to this literacy question, let's hmm. understand it and not fear it. Uh, now there's you know a whole bunch of stuff going on with how we might regulate it, et cetera. I don't know enough about that area. I'm sort of move cautiously, <laughs> I would say. Well, that's interesting. That's hmm. interesting. I mean, this is this is so different from the usual sense that AI is a tsunami and it's going to mm. swamp everything. Um, I mean, how, so how can, uh, I mean, based on that idea that, um, that AI and other forms of automation are likely to impact slices of jobs, but not to replace entire jobs, like your example of offshoring, um, how should colleges and universities best prepare students for this? Uh, it, it's a great question. Uh, there's a bunch of work by a guy named just on the the morphing of, of skills, a guy named Harry Braverman, who looked at how yeah, uh, yeah. work changes occupations at the task level. And I think if we start with that uh, and take a look at universities beginning to think about taking building portfolios. Right. And so having a portfolio that gets your first job, you need to have some specific skills, but having right. a portfolio that lets you be flexible and move between skill sets. And so some really great literature on specific, specific versus general education is that specific education lets you know how to do the thing. General education lets you understand the underlying rule structure of the task that you're doing and transport it to a different place. And so that encompasses a whole body of things, the whole contextual nature and, and move it. So I think the higher education institutions need to start wrapping their head around this. Because one of the downsides, I think, of a four-year education is we don't always we can't put our finger on why the general education component is valuable, how it leads to client face-to-face -face interaction or flexibility. It does, if you look at comparisons between economies, but we don't know how it does. So the higher education institutions ought to start thinking about diving more deeply into this. Like, what is it? And then how does that help build these portfolios that are a balance between, which are going to have to be this AI literacy component, you might be engaging it, developing it, or at least understanding right. it. And your specific skill set, you need to, like I used to be a carpenter, you need to know how to swing a hammer, right? You got yeah. a very specific task that needs to be done. And that's going to happen on all jobs, your job, my job, there's a thing you need to do, and you need to do it well. And then there's this other set of skills that help you be flexible. The universities need to figure this out. You know, how do we deliver the best possible flexible portfolio without we have to avoid becoming a cafeteria model. We just can't serve every combination of goods, but try to identify the main components that we think education should deliver and then pressure test that against the clientele, which is the student. And to some degree that education aligns with work, we also have to check in with the employer. Uh, you know, how 
how does this work? You know, and this is where I do like the community colleges and, and many post-secondary institutions who ask the employer, like, what do you think? They might not bend o- necessarily bend over for the employer. We don't want that happening, but they listen. They create some type of feedback loop. And I think the more the four-year institutions do this, the more they'll be quote unquote future proof because they're adjusting to the today, right? Today mm-hmm. and tomorrow. No, oh, this is fascinating. I, I mean, so in, in a sense, what you would advise is don't ask the computer science department to double the number of, AI, you know, of majors, but instead to infuse AI work through the general curriculum and to do that with an eye on uh, workforce development, actually, and workforce outcomes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, oh, that, that's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, You're and, welcome. and as always, uh, Brent, uh, thank you for the for the excellent question. He has a, a couple more, but we'll, we'll circle back to him on, on, okay. on that. We have uh, others that are coming in, and this is one from uh, our good friend uh, Heidi Hendershot at Fisher College. And uh, she asks, uh, I believe for some time the metrics of the Department of Higher Education and other accrediting agencies use are dated. Can you talk more about the data used by the Center on Education and the Workforce? Uh, I'm not 100% sure about the, the metrics she's pointing to on from the Department of Ed. Uh, is that, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. My fine. phone, my headphones talking to me. Uh, sorry. Um, All right. Um, could you, could you reset the question? Sorry. I got of this course, of course. No problem. No problem. Um, that the, uh, problems with the metrics used by the Department of Higher Education and other accreditation agencies. Okay. Um, and, uh, so she wants to know in contrast, I guess, can you talk more about the data used by your center? Right. Uh, well, we're, you know, multifaceted because we often look at labor market issues. So we use a wide variety of American community survey, labor oriented data. And then we use some skills data from what's called ONET, which is a big data set created by the Department of Labor to uh, use industrial psychologists to really try to unbundle work into skill bundles. Problem with ONET, it doesn't really lead to teachable items, which I think is a, a big problem, but it does let us know kind of these skill bases. Uh, we do some work with you know, PAC data, things like that. And then on the accreditation or outcomes, we tend to use, we try to use the scorecard data that's come out, the, co- the, the college scorecard produced by the Department of Education, which links program graduates to tax records. So you have a pretty good understanding. So you have cost data from the uh, uh, student, uh, the uh, uh, student financial data system, I forget the actual name for it. So you got all the records on a loan taking. So you're able to look at the cost structure of programs, what p- debt people carry, not the actual cost structure, sorry, but the debt load taken on by individuals and then the uh, uh, earnings outcomes. Now, the problem with the scorecard, you end up with some missingness because of some uh, restrictions on sample size and things like that. So that's a core data set that we use for uh evaluating program outcomes now i think we need to do a bit more and add into that area i think employment uh stability i think would be very important so oftentimes when we look at uh, earnings you're looking at a point in time and it doesn't necessarily reflect somebody's employment trajectory through the labor market uh and i think that's an important consideration so somebody could start high in end low could start high and flatten out right and so not really barely even keep up with inflation so mm-hmm. these are questions that we want uh to be asking um i don't understand so yeah and actually just uh, uh on another note too we've been doing a bunch of work looking at how post-secondary institutions community colleges at this point how their program out their graduate output aligns with labor market demand projected out to about 2032 so that's another way of looking yeah. at institutional performance but not necessarily program performance so. yeah i'm very fond of that kind of work um in, in the in the chat heidi says that's very helpful thank you okay thank you and uh and this is uh, heidi one of the reasons why i've got jeff uh, here is because the cw does such really really good data-driven work um we have a, a and thank you heidi uh for the really good question we have another question coming in uh from uh, wisconsin um, this is uh, a question uh, concerning um, curiosity. This is from Dean Matthew Vick. Is there a response you could give us? Should someone say the reason liberal arts majors do better on those skills is because they self-selected those majors, i.e. from curiosity? Wow. That's a very great question. Yeah. Um, 
if the paper that I mentioned earlier on occupational funneling is the case, no, I wouldn't say they necessarily self-select. I think it would be a, a constrained optimality that they're running into. There will be a group, of course, who self-selects. Uh, but I think there's another group who are just uh, they're either ones who are firmly committed and haven't been dissuaded. Oh, gee, you're silly to do that. You should become a blah, 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 uh, which happens there You know when they hit college. Yeah. Um, and so it, this is a, a, a good question. I wish I don't have an immediate answer. My son just started as a freshman in, in Wisconsin and watching his cohort and the divide between those going to purely liberal arts institutions and those across the rest of the divide, econo uh, I mean, uh, engineering, et cetera, is interesting. So uh, I'm going to have to think about that. And I'd love to talk to you more about your question once I think about it some more. Well, sure, 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 sure. No, it's a uh, uh, Matthew. I, I that's a really interesting question to, mm. to think about. Um, I guess it, it kind of leads us down the road of does higher education transform people, or does it actually instead express things that are pre-selected? So someone who comes to you with that kind of curiosity, you know, we get to reinforce it. Um, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, no, I was just going to say what thought came to mind is that this is a really important function, I think, that the liberal arts institutions can play back to this occupational funneling. There's great work that's done that shows that when we do deficit reduction, we get extremely small gains. But when we do strength reinforcement, we get very large gains. The American K-12 education is all about deficit reduction. So we're basically avoiding yeah. the, 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 the strength, the things that people are really interested in. And it's just that unique student who pops up. So back to the self-selection, of course, there's some who self-select in and they succeed because they're motivated, but we lose these folks haven't figured out what motivates them. And both in liberal arts and non-liberal arts, the more we could do with our counseling apparatus, which is underfunded, uh, to help students value their own interests and not against these external criterion uh, that someone else has given them and pursue it. I think we'd have a more um, overall rewarding society in the sense of, of human flourishing, um, you know, putting aside mm -hmm. the, you know, you got to make a living, you got to make a living, but you know, 50,000, 75, 378,000. I mean, it's, you know, at the point, uh, I think people would be so much happier if, they latched on to something and not just the dollar mm -hmm. you're forced to latch on to the dollar let's face that it's a reality right mm -hmm. um but can you find a mini max between those two of your own interest in uh um your job mm -hmm. that, that's now now we've we've gone from looking at the labor market institutions to well actually it sounds like really good advice um for uh, an individual student um you know trying to find that latch um, the, um, well, thank you again. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and, uh, I'm, I'm really glad you asked it, Matthew. And I, I'd love to hear more about the conversations that that came from. Um, now what I'd like to do is bring, uh, our own Wesson Radomski up on stage because Wesson has a question and I wanted to give them a chance to ask it. So here we go. Hello, Wesson. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, so shall I just dive right in? Dive right in. Okay. Um, so I'm really curious about what you've been seeing and hearing about any efforts to integrate what we've been learning about what and known for a long time about what liberal education does in sort of long-term career success and development and sort of personal formation and public good, all of those things that we see. I'm not necessarily interested in trying to get everyone into those degree programs right. mm -hmm. so much as weave those benefits into more professionally oriented programs. And I think particularly of a lot of people in my life that have gone to trade schools mm -hmm. who have found themselves in their 30s and 40s, 50s, 60s even, needing to do some amount of pivoting in their career, but not going to go back to a four degree, four year degree at that time. And so I'm really curious, mm. particularly with your focus on education in the workforce, you know, community colleges have often been the place we've sent folks for a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. But what does it look like now if we're really trying to meet kind of 
future needs and getting people who aren't going to go back for the four-year degree, but who need meaningful training that goes beyond perhaps what can be measured on a certification, but is about professional development, Mm -hmm. career trajectory, and soft skills. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot in that, that question. So the first part, I'll just uh, get, get, uh, get through very quickly. Regretfully, the whole research area on general education has been a general versus specific education and hasn't uh, dove in deeply uh, to any kind of analytic nuance to help address that part of your, your question. And I'm trying to put together an agenda to come to the conclusion that the U.S. economy is a, is general and uh, specific, to treat them as complements, not substitutes. And so often the work done, Eric Hanyashak is one who does it, is a, a comparison between a general and specific economies. Uh, and actually my dissertation work sort of took the same angle. You miss the nuances and you miss the particulars of the U.S. economy. On the Second part of your question, or if I can divide it that way anyway, is, you know, getting into the reskilling uh, issue. This is really uh, uh, important because for those workers and people who can't, um, who, who get hit by rest- economic restructuring, uh, we call it, you know, uh, readjustment, um, they need help. And we need to make an investment in our workforce training system. You see that uh, our training is a quarter of what it, our, our official training is a quarter of what it was around 1980 under CETA. I forget what, exactly what CETA stands. So we've had this huge decline uh, in the amount of money that we put into dislocated workers uh, and to help them make the move. So. It's, it, it's a real pity. And what we do, and I think certifications are a marker of this, we've pushed that training responsibility back onto the worker. So if you're talking about middle class, lower middle class, they've already got the burden of job loss. And then we're pushing the training cost onto them through some of these items to help them update their skills. I mean, it's, it, it, it's a pity. Uh, and so there have been some really, really good efforts in this regard. One was called the uh, Community College Trade Adjustment Act, of which they actually mm-hmm. tried to uh, do trade adjustment assistance, not through uh, impacted directly on trade at the individual level, but on the regional level, and then work through the community college. And part of the, the beauty of this type of work was that they needed to demonstrate that there was uh, labor demand at the other end. Often training is, gee, we have a good training program, and it could be, but then not necessarily at the job placement part, so you end up with unemployment. Uh, and I think it really needs to be this uh, symbiosis between uh, training and the outcomes, because if you have too many graduates or they're, you're out of, out, of, out of alignment, all you do is create unemployment, right? So it could be a great program. And so people in the skilled trades suffer this more uh, because they need to get a new skill um, and it has to be identifiable. Thankfully, some of those programs, I used to be in, in the construction trades, some of those programs are short term learning a new technology, moving from a hammer to a nail gun. I mean, that's a simplistic example, but yeah. mm-hmm. there are some leaps that are not training distance large. Right. And so we can move them. But if the entire um occupation goes away, it's very difficult. So if we look at case of North Carolina, tobacco, textiles, unemployment. Right. So the the strategy just had human wastage on that one. Right. That the people who uh, made in the textile and then lost their jobs out of textiles, you know, there there were the losers in the game. And we might do some minor, you know, UI unemployment adjustment. But, you know, it's just really not enough. And so there is too much human carnage in um, structural adjustments in the economy. And so we do need, I believe, bigger investments to help those workers move and make decisions on the professional you know, development. Often it might be still within the blue collar sector or the modern blue collar sector, which gets into a lot of technological. And that's actually a movement that can really be made, which is help someone move from hands on to hands on plus technology, right, to help them move with the economy and not just pick up the low hanging fruit right in front of you, right? To you can do this, so you know here's the next job. It's you know suited. You can actually help them move a little further, but it takes investment. 
And again, we're a quarter of what we were in 1980. We don't use what are called active labor market policies. So we don't actually take our training and have it adjust in, in, in alignment with, with uh, employers to actually lead to new jobs. Uh, a tr apprenticeships does this to some degree, but it's not really part of our uh, training reaction system, right? So just we need to just do better. And compared to the rest of the world, the, the, the amount of investment as a percentage of GDP, we're, I, I forget what fraction we are, but it's, it pales in comparison. Uh, and actually, just one last note, in Europe, they call it VET, Vocational Employment and Training. And the outcomes among the VET participants, employment level and earnings is commonly higher than the traditional, what we would call, um, you know, standard uh, uh, education programs. And so they have an economy that's built to work with it. We don't necessarily have it. So hopefully that helps. It makes sense. Thank you so much for yeah, that detail answer. I really appreciate the way you engaged with the question. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Weston. And as always, thank you for all the work you do to help make the forum work, Weston. Happy to. Um, we have um, uh, one observation uh, that came in from uh, one of our guests who just had to run out from a fire alarm. So I want to <laughs> make sure that at least uh, we share this observation. This is uh, Professor Ed Webb in uh, Central Pennsylvania. He says, uh, my factory worker grandparents back in Leeds, Northern England, benefited a lot from night classes through the Workers' Education Association, foreign languages and other interests, not necessarily work focused, but life enhancing. So I, I, want, I wanted to share that as a, as a you know, really, really good anecdote. And, uh, yeah, well, we used to do it too. Read, uh, you know, Emma Goldman's Living My Life, yes. looking at the U.S. labor market, uh, labor uh, movement from about 1890 through about 1920. And so we, we, don't, have enough, we don't have enough anarchist uh, representation on the forum. So I'm glad that you brought up uh, Red Emma. Uh, she makes me very happy. Um, yeah, we had uh, also the uh, different uh, events. There was always the, the Chautauquas, but also the uh, Athenians, uh, Athenia, um, and, uh, and a few more. Um, we are almost out of time. I just want to give you two minutes to answer a big futures oriented question. Okay. Because if, if I could put you in charge of a given university or college and you could just, you know, go to work making it transformed so that it best prepares students for the world of work, what might that mythical campus look like in say five years? How, how would it differ from, from other campuses in the U S? Wow. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I think you would have, it wouldn't be monolithic because the students themselves aren't monolithic. Right. I think you would have a component aimed at alignment with work. And I think I would follow uh, some of the labor college movement where, mm. you know, the education and the, you know, the classroom and the workplace are as close together as possible. Um, I think I would borrow from things like the Tennessee Technical College system where you bring practitioners into the classroom on a rotating basis so that the teachers are front and center on the cutting edge things that are happening out in the world and the workplace mm -hmm. and not necessarily a dusty uh, textbook. On the other hand, uh, dusty textbook contains the accumulated knowledge that you want somebody. So we find to find that balance between those two. And then I think there's, you know, you're trying to sort out the uh, uh, expo self exploration, right? And so we've got this cost problem in post secondary. So if I could wish away the fact that it costs money, Mm -hmm. uh, I would certainly encourage exploration, but for many students, it's currently uh, one where can't really afford an additional year of college at you know the cost that they have. So I I uh, condition my thing about doing self exploration. Right, you don't want it to lead somebody with debt. Maybe you do auditing. Uh, maybe you enable kids to come in and. Um, take a few classes for free, not not major bearing, not credit bearing, but actually come come explore a college and see if it's what you want to do so that maybe we get rid of part of that dropout problem that's associated with college isn't for me. Right. And then the last piece, which I think is a really important, is um, for some students who didn't do very well in high school 
uh, it's a pity to put them in college and say, here, redo your high school math. No, no, no. We want to teach some of these topics for students who want to do it. We have to be real careful about tracking here um, and do, you know, contextual learning. So for me, I was, like I said, I was in construction. I learned math and the value of good math by building a roof. Mm -hmm. Trigonometry, it really, really mattered if you got the angle right. It really, really mattered if you got that 64th yep. of an inch uh, yep. on there. And all of a sudden, I had a real appreciation for math and, and actually the utilization. So there are people who can grow if you start meeting them where they're at. And that's stop forcing kids back to high school. Now, I don't want to go back to high school. Where do you force them back to high school? They're they're yeah. becoming adults, so maybe we need to. Mo and that would be an experiment that I think would be uh, well well worth pursuing more. I and mean, there's examples out in the field where it is incurring. So I'm building off of things I've seen that I think are uh, interesting and hopefully successful. I, I think a lot of us would love to attend Stroll University. <laughs> um, that, that's a great vision. That's a great vision. In in the chat, people have been uh, adding some thoughts. There have been people who have been talking about uh, lifelong learning um, and um, uh, people talking about um, some of the different ways of, uh, of, of learning without a credential. Uh, Catherine James offers this one nice point. She says, as one who works in the CETA program, I can share this acronym stands for Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, oh, mm -hmm. many of the goals you have mentioned. But I, I'm afraid we have, to, we have to wrap things up. We have just blasted past the top of the hour. Jeff, you've been a fantastic guest. I, I, Thank I you. love all of your answers and, and your passion for this is just infectious. What's what's the best way to keep up with you? Should we just keep going to the CW site or do you have a news? Uh, you know, you're ha uh, happy to email me at uh, JS787 at Georgetown.edu, but also our website. We have a full team. I'm just the, the, the figurehead for a lot of really good uh, people who are doing really good work. Uh, so I don't take the credit for their and <laughs> their success. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Please uh, take care, Jeff. And thank uh, you. I'll talk to you in person soon. All right. Thank you. Take care. Now, don't go away yet, friends. Uh, I just want to wrap things up, but uh, also to thank you for the great questions and the great uh, uh, meditations that come up in the, in the chat. Um, uh, Gary, I'd, I'd love to bring uh, Jeff back too. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about this, everything from the kind of lifelong adult learning with or without credentials and how to reform an institution, we just keep talking about this on social media. Uh, just use the hashtag FTTE, and here you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky. Um, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions where we talk about workforce development, as well as the connection between campuses and labor market, uh, you can go back to our archive, tinyurl.com slash archive. If you'd like to look into our upcoming sessions, we have more topics coming, everything from enrollment to reforming grading to teaching and learning centers. Um, you can find out more at the Future Transform website, forum.futureofeducation.us. Thank you again uh, for all of your great questions and comments. As always, it's a pleasure to think and uh, work together with all of you. I hope everybody's safe and sound as uh, fall semester progresses. We'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>